The Buddha compared mindfulness to a gatekeeper in a fortress at the edge of a frontier. In a fortress like that, you've got to have a gatekeeper who really knows what he's doing. Knows who to let in, who not to let in. Who to trust, who not to trust. In the same way, mindfulness is there to sort out what's skillful and what's unskillful. Because the function of mindfulness is to remember, to keep something in mind. And you want to keep in mind what's skillful, what's not skillful. And then the function of right effort is to actually make the effort to encourage skillful qualities in the mind and to abandon unskillful ones. There's a fair amount of judgment that goes along in that. You have to judge what's skillful and what's not skillful. It's like a craftsperson. So you're working on a chest of drawers and you're doing the planing and the sawing and the measuring, and you've got to Watch carefully what you're doing, and if you see that you're making a mistake or things aren't fitting together quite right, you've got to figure out what to do to fix the situation. That means you've built up a fair amount of knowledge already from all the chests of drawers and other pieces of furniture that you've made in the past. Because as you're working on a skill like that, you're always going to be running into problems. In the beginning, you depend on your teacher to point out what the problems are, how to solve them. But as you gain more and more experience, you begin to see the problems on your own and can figure out the solutions on your own. So that requires, on the one hand, knowledge and, two, a certain sense of confidence. You don't fall to pieces when the blade of the plane digs into the wood in a way you didn't want it to. You figure out how to change what you're doing so that the, the mark doesn't show. And it's the same with the meditation. It's a combination of building up experience. Learning from the books, learning from teachers, what you want to do with the meditation, and when problems come up, get some ideas about how to handle them. And then you notice on your own which problems you've been able to solve and how you've solved them in the past, and you want to keep that in mind. So if that problem comes up again, you have a technique ready. And at the same time, you need to have a certain amount of confidence that you can do this. You've done it in the past, and you're going to be able to keep on doing it into the future. As you face issues that are more and more delicate, more and more refined, they go deeper into the mind. If you're starting out with a meditation, you need some things outside of the meditation itself to build up that sense of confidence. And this is why the Buddha talked about the two things that really help mindfulness along. What he said is purified virtue and views made straight. The straightened out views basically come down to remembering that whatever suffering you're experiencing right now is an important issue. That's the problem. And the suffering that weighs down on the mind comes from within the mind itself. And if there's going to be a solution, it has to come from within the mind too. That's all part of right view. In other words, your, your actions are what make all the difference. And so the solution is going to have to come from your actions. You can't wait for some special person outside or some special being outside to come and solve the problem for you. If you believe that there will be somebody out there who's going to save you or deliver you from your sins or whatever, you wouldn't have to be all that mindful. Just basically do what you want and hope that there's going to be salvation at the end from somebody else.
You don't have to really straighten out your act, because someone else is going to do it for you. But if you realize you're the one who has to do the, the work, so you're going to have to keep certain principles in mind and you're going to have to keep the lessons you've learned in mind, that gives you a lot more impetus to want to remember, well, what is skillful and what's not? And you want to keep it in mind as you're practicing. And this purified virtue. This helps with mindfulness in a lot of ways. To begin with, if you're going to be keeping the precepts, you have to keep them in mind. It's not a matter of going through the ceremony of taking the precepts and hoping that the ceremony is going to take care of everything for you. You make an intention, you set up an intention that you're not going to kill, you're not going to steal. And you you're not going to have illicit sex, you're not going to lie, you're not going to take intoxicants, and then you stick with it. Now to stick with it, you have to keep remembering. Because if in the past you've been breaking these precepts, it's awfully easy to fall into those old habits. And when you fall into the old habits, you start out developing some wrong views around them, about how you can't make a difference. And it's just the way you are. They did a study recently where they had people play a game when it was really easy to cheat on the game. It was pretty transparent that you could cheat and get away with it. And right before playing the game, they had the people reading some pieces on free will and determinism. And there was one piece that was really strongly deterministic, that nobody has any free will, that whatever they are, that's the way they're going to be. And the people who read that tended to cheat more than the others. And of course, the people who cheat more, they want to justify it to themselves, and they say, well, I just couldn't do it any other way. So it's a vicious circle. The wrong view leads to the wrong behavior, and the wrong behavior leads to the wrong view. And so you don't see any reason to try to remember what's skillful or what's not, because apparently it wouldn't make any difference if that's what you believe and that's the way you've been behaving. But if you realize that you can change your ways if you try hard enough and if you figure out how to get around the temptation to break the precepts, That strengthens your understanding of why you want to be mindful. Keep on top of things. At the same time, if you've been engaging in unskillful behavior you don't want to think about, it, you'd like to forget about it. Tendency to forget also becomes a habit, which makes it harder to develop mindfulness when you're going to sit down and meditate. Your mind ranges back into the past, and all you can see are unskillful things. You start putting up walls of forgetfulness, and that becomes a habit. It's a habit that's hard to get out of. So that's still another reason why you want to develop, develop this quality of virtue. You look back on your behavior, and there's nothing to criticize yourself about. And you gain a sense of confidence because you realize, okay, I can do this. I can make this change. That's a lot of one of the reason why the Buddha has you reflect on virtue when you find that your meditation is not going well. You realize you do have some good to you, and you have been able to change your ways in the past. You have been able to learn from your mistakes. And this makes it easier to recognize and learn from your mistakes in the meditation. Because you're developing a more skillful attitude to how to judge your behavior. There's so much fear about judging behavior nowadays. 
That's basically the fear that comes from people who are really unskillful. And they figure, if I don't judge my behavior and don't judge other people's behavior, they won't judge mine. It's kind of an easy out. But things don't work that way. But if you've been learning how to get more skillful in your behavior, then when you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. You know that you do have some good to you. And so you're able to take mistakes in stride, and not try to deny them, not try to forget about them. And also, at the same time, you're just not defeated by them. You're developing that quality that leads into concentration, because a part of being mindful is to bring the mind into a concentrated state. And one of the first factors in concentration is evaluation. You evaluate what's going on in the meditation. How's the breath going? Could it be better? If you're skilled at judging your own behavior in general, it's a lot easier to make skillful judgments about the breath. Neither hypercritical nor hypocritical. You're able to see precisely what's happening, and you have the confidence to try to figure out what's the solution. Knowing that this is important, this is how you're going to straighten out the mind. This is how you're going to re gain release from suffering. This is why the Buddha started his instructions to Rahula with how to act. One, how to be truthful, and then two, how to evaluate your intentions, how to evaluate your actions, and how to learn from them. So when you make a mistake, <coughs> excuse me, when you make a mistake, it's not the end of the world. But at the same time, you recognize it as a mistake. You're trying to figure out how not to do it. You seek the advice of others, you observe for yourself, and you develop that resolve that I don't want to repeat that mistake. I don't want to harm myself. I don't want to harm others. It's a way of developing compassion for yourself and for others. It's genuine compassion, not the compassion that says, well, we're not just going to judge things at all and let things go. That's not compassion at all. True compassion is when you see a mistake, you want to do what you can to learn how not to repeat it. Because the mistakes do cause harm. And it's only when you admit that they cause harm and realize that there's another way, which is within your capabilities. That's when you're showing genuine compassion to yourself. And that's when you're using your powers of judgment in a wise way. So what this comes down to is the fact that your practice of meditation is not divorced from the way you live your life. These qualities of having right view, developing the virtues of right action and right speech. And this is why the Buddha listed these things before right mindfulness in the Eightfold Path, because they really do provide the conditions that allow mindfulness to get really strong. So when you learn a lesson, you remember it, you keep it in mind, and you can apply it again and again and again, whenever appropriate. And that's how the path all comes together. <laughs>